Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Irvin Scott, and we're getting ready to start this session in about two minutes. We're going to be hearing from some great teachers. Um, so in about two minutes, if you're in another session, you can move on to that. If you're in this session, we're going to start in two minutes. We're going to let our speakers, teachers come up, and we're going to get started. So great to see everyone. Um, good afternoon. We're excited. Again, my name is Irvin Scott from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Excited about this opportunity. Former teacher, taught for years, um, and can't, I couldn't imagine Learning Forward having a session that I would be a part of without having teachers. And so I'm just so excited about this opportunity to hear directly back from teachers in the field now on a host of topics. And I will also tell you that um, by the end of the session, we'll have some op opportunities for you to ask questions. We have a microphone there, or you can write down a question and maybe someone can run it up. Um, but today is, um, this time is spent um, devoted to hearing directly back from them. So I'd like to introduce them. First of all, we have Michelle Logan. Um, Michelle is a teacher in Loveland, Colorado. She does multimedia work, she does instructional coaching, she's the IB coordinator, she's just busy, busy, busy. Um, and we're excited to have her. We have Adam Evans, and Adam is a teacher at Frank Ballou High School here in District of Columbia, in Pub District of Columbia, DC Public Schools. Social Studies teacher, department chair, 12th grade, DC history and government, is, he's teaching AP history. Also, I had the um, AP US history. I had the pleasure of uh, spending some time in Adam's classroom a few months ago, um, and it was a joy. Um, and we also have Carly Fox. Carly is from Mari, is it? Mari Elementary School um, in DCPS, District of Columbia, and she is a second grade teacher. And then finally, we have Keisha Charles, and Keisha is from Wise, uh, let's see, Henry A. Wise Jr. High School in Prince George's County Public Schools. She's an instructional coordinator. Would you please help me welcome these teachers? So let's just jump into it. We've been talking a lot about story um, through our keynotes um, and through some of the things that we've been talking about. Let's just start with an easy question. Can each one of you in about two or three minutes give me your teacher story? How did you get where you are today? What were you hoping to accomplish coming into this profession? What's your teacher story? Let's start with Michelle, if you don't mind. Well, it all started with um, the pumpkins in my grandmother's garden. I talked to them and I talked to them and they grew and they grew and they grew and at that point I knew I was going to be a teacher because they grew. No one told me it had to do with the water and the fertilizer. I thought it was all me. But um, it was early in my career, um, I got into education and early in the career I had administrators and colleagues that took my thoughts and empowered me to move ahead and to say, why not? And we were in a culture of, of that learning environment was, yes, what else can you do? And that was the exciting piece. I didn't have any of the answers, but I had an idea. And they sparked that idea by saying, go forth, try it. And mm -hmm. it was that, that moment, you know, 25 years ago that no one said, yes, but. They all said, why don't you try it? So we started some new things and new initiatives in our district and it was like it rolled and teachers got on board and the next teacher said, why not? And then it just kind of grew and grew and, and just like the pumpkins, it's like no one told me it was something else. So therefore mm -hmm. I felt that it was the stuff that we were doing in the classroom. Great. Keisha? Um, well, I um, 
started out substitute teaching only because I finished college in December and had to wait for May graduation. So I'm subbing and I'm just, it was a suggestion from someone. And um, a lot of the older teachers were like, you're just doing a fabulous job. And I'm like, I'm a journalism major. You have no idea, I'm gonna work for CNN. Like, you know, this is just <laughs> temporary. And so, you know, the kids were just awesome and I, you know, just, responded to them and they responded to me and so I said okay well clearly this is a sign and I had done some work with CNN and I started to realize okay this is not what I thought it was this is not what I learned in college and so then I did the te a teacher education program this was all in Atlanta Georgia I started working for Atlanta Public Schools um, got married my husband refused to not live in Maryland which is where he's from and so I came here and I've been in Prince George's County now for 21 years um, I've uh, surrounded myself always with um, people who knew just as much or more than me because I just wanted to learn and grow. And so I've been fortunate enough to do that here in the district. And it's been, I started out in elementary school, um, then I went to middle, and now I'm in high school where I ne you could have never told me I was going to be in high school. But um, it's just been a great ride, and um, I can't believe it's been that long. And um, I just really am passionate about the students. Um, I miss the middle school students, but you know the high school students are just as great. So that's pretty much it. Awesome. So Michelle, I didn't ask you, how many years have you been teaching? This is my 27th year. 27th year. In case you... 21 I'm, in this district. 21. Excellent. Adam. No, I look 21. Yes, you do. <laughs> So I, uh, my story also begins in the state of Georgia, strangely enough. Um, I enjoyed school growing up. Just I loved books and talking about history. So naturally, I'm a history teacher now. Um, it wasn't until I went to graduate school to actually get a master's in history that I was a teaching assistant and realized that freshmen in college don't often know how to write a thesis statement. Mm. Um, and that was a problem for me. So I had the great foresight to decide to go to graduate school instead of getting a job right after, uh, right after undergrad and then the recession hit. So you can do some math there. So in 2008, I was looking for a job uh, and I wound up taking a job as a high school history teacher, but I was the only high school history teacher for grades nine through 12. That was a little stressful. So I decided to move cities and start teaching at a middle school where I was the only middle school teacher middle school social studies teacher for fifth grade through eighth grade. So I decide, long story short, met a girl, moved to DC, and uh, <laughs> love it here. Yeah. And I've taught ninth grade through 12th grade for the past five years in DC. But uh, the reason why I wanted to get involved in teacher leadership was because I know that there's a lot of demands on teachers, and if I was going to be demanded to do something, I wanted to have a voice in it. So if there's gonna be end of course test, I wanna be the one that writes it. And if there's going to be a project that we have to do, I want to be the one that writes it or at least be in the room for that. So, um, and just in advocating for my students and in advocating for my own voice in the room, people have been very receptive to that. Excellent. Thank you. Carly? So my story is that for as long as I can remember, I've wanted to be a teacher. Um, I can't even remember a day that I didn't want to be. Um, my first grade teacher was my inspiration, one of my favorite people I've ever met in my whole life. Um, and actually, the summer before my first year of teaching, I got coffee with her, and she was like, I remember when you were this big and you wanted to be a teacher. And I'm not much taller than that, but um, it, it's, I guess I'm living the dream, and here I am. Um, and so I went to Syracuse, studied education there, um, and was just really blown away by my professors and their love for urban education and special education in the midst of elementary education. So um, I found my niche there and moved to DC right after graduation and worked in a charter school for three years and have been in a DC public school for three years. Awesome. So this is, um, I'm gonna continue with this theme of sort of getting to know you guys um, and then we'll jump into some a little more difficult uh, questions perhaps. Carly actually started us off a little bit with a theme that I want to keep and that is when she talked about her first grade teacher. Um, if the other three of you can talk about a model teacher that you ha you've had in mind as you teach, is there a particular teacher that you say, you know what, I want to be like that. I know when I taught for, for years that one of the teachers was Mr. Gray, the guy that I put up on the screen there. Has, has, there, any, has there been anyone in your teaching experience that looks, that played that role? Adam? 
and why? What brought? What, what what was it about them? So when I first started teaching, I really wanted to be like the uh, football coach that taught me history and could tell a great story and would sit there and everyone would just sit enthralled at, at what the uh, things he was telling us about 19th century America. Um, but as I've as I've kind of evolved in my teaching and realizing what my actual students need, there's actually a. Uh, a gentleman who used to be in DC public schools, now he works for the Center for Inspired Teaching, that I've sat through so many professional developments with him mm. that, I mean, I tell him all the time, he's my professional hero. Um, I can sit back and we can actually collaborate and learn so much in just a you know 15 minute coffee that, um, but it's, it's never him telling me anything. It's always him just asking the right questions. Yeah. So for me, that's always challenged me to go from being somebody who enjoyed the lecture to being the person who just asked the right questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Keisha? Well, I went to Catholic school my entire life, and so um, it's a very strict environment, the Jesuit priests and the, the nuns, and so there were some, a few lay teachers in, um, in my um, elementary and high school, and um, that were a little different from um, the nuns and the priests who were very regimented. And um, so this one teacher, um, she was very patient and she um, ran her classroom in a way that everyone was accepted. There was no um, teasing. She made that very clear um, right away. And there were no wrong answers. And she, at that time, I didn't realize it, but she was kind of letting us learn at our own pace. And you know, I was a kid, so I didn't realize what I know now. But I, I think back to a lot of the things that she would do in class discussions, and sometimes it, she wouldn't even say anything. She would just look at the kid who looks like they're about to snicker, or, mm -hmm. and I was like, oh, I'm going to look like that too. Learn that. See if my students are going to respond. So it was just the way that she, and she was very calm, mm -hmm. um, didn't raise her voice. Um, and everyone got along. We had very few behavior problems, and it was just an awesome environment, and you felt really comfortable. It was very different from some of the other um, classes that I went into. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Michelle? So it sounds like we, we have all the same teachers, which is great. You know, in the one that comes to mind is this, this classroom environment that it was challenging, and Mr. Bruner let us know that what we were going to undertake was going to be challenging, that it wasn't going to be just a breeze, and that school wasn't necessarily easy, but he was going to be there to make sure that we could reach our potential. Mm -hmm. And the expectations were extremely high. We knew when we walked in the room that this is what had to happen. And we're always like, oh my gosh, did you get Mr. Bruner? Yeah. But we'd always come back. Every year, there would be students coming back from their first year in college or whatever and say, you know what? That was the best class I ever had. Mm. You, you knew we could do it, and you didn't change one minute of your expectations, and that we all came and we rose to the occasion. And I appreciate that. You know, we, we need to acknowledge that school's hard, and the concepts we want students to really delve into and chew on aren't things that should be easy. We should take time to really dig deep into what that means and construct new meaning. And because of him and because of teachers yeah. like what Keisha and Adam have talked described is, is really the inspiration for every day when we come to work. Excellent. Great. Thank you so much. That helps us to un better understand who you are as teachers. We really appreciate that. Um, so I want to do something real quick. Um, one last question for you that is more introductory, but I want to involve the audience also. Um, how many current or former teachers do we have in the audience? Raise your hand. Oh my goodness, it's pretty much everyone. Okay, awesome. So I want you to do the same thing, panelists, that I'm getting ready to ask the audience to do. So audience, especially those of you who are teachers or former teachers. I want everyone to think about their teacher preparation experience. It could be traditional, non-traditional, doesn't matter, how you were prepared to um, become a teacher, and I want you to rate it, rate it, right, on a scale of one to 10. 10 being unbelievable. I could teach the day I was done with that program, I was ready to take on any class you give me. Okay, that's an extreme, all right? And then one being, oh my goodness, 
I, I'm not sure why I spent that money because I just could, I had, I had no idea what was going on, all right? So everyone's gonna do that. You're doing it in your head, you don't have to write it down. Everyone's rated your teacher prep experience and I want you panelists to rate your teacher prep experience also. Okay, everyone got your number? All right, so we're gonna do a real quick poll, uh, but we're only gonna hear from the panelists. All right, so I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give the numbers and you're gonna raise your hand at your number. All right, where should I start? Start with 10 or start with zero? One. Okay, let's, I saw hands shaking on 10. Okay, how many 10s? Look around, nine. Okay, one, not two nines, eight. Wow, seven, six, five, four, three, wow, two, one, okay. It's important for us to see that. So what I'd love for you to do, panelists, my last introductory question, give us your number and tell us why you rated it at that level. Start with Carly. So I gave it an eight. Um, I could not say enough wonderful things about the teacher prep program at Syracuse. I think, you know, thinking about my first class of kids, like I had no idea what I was getting myself into regardless of how many student teaching opportunities I had, um, regardless of the class and my professors. There's just nothing like that first year of teaching and I probably was more prepared than I thought. Um, but I think it, it goes back to um, a very collaborative environment in the school. Syracuse University is a big place, but our program was only 50 people. I knew every single person was in class with them from day one of freshman year. Um, and we were in the classroom a lot, and I had a lot of real time um, to really delve into my practice and see a lot of really great teachers in the Syracuse area. And there is nothing like seeing a good teacher teach. And um, I believe like a lot of what I do is because of the teachers that I saw and the experiences that I had there. And to clarify, when you say we were in the classroom a lot, you meant actually cl actual yeah, classrooms. Yeah, our practicum experiences started first semester of freshman year, and there was first only semester. So I studied abroad and didn't have a practicum that semester, and then there was only one other semester. Every other semester, we had time in the classroom. Great, thank you, Adam. I want to go to Syracuse now. <laughs> Uh, I went to the University of Georgia for undergrad, and I was a double major in history. Go dogs. Uh, BS Ed and uh, AB in history. And I gave mine a seven because my actual student teaching experience was a part of it, and I got so much out of that. The actual classroom theoretical, dis theoretical discussions, although completely necessary to lay a good framework for how to build my career, didn't give me the most practical skills. And it wasn't until I actually got in the classroom and my cooperating teacher said, here's the keys, mm. teach, that I really was forced to reckon with the decision I had made professionally. Um, but that relationship with him and focusing on problem solving in an actual classroom, one-on-one, -on -one, was the most formative uh, experience for my undergrad. Great, thank you. Keisha? Well, I... Um went back and did um, teacher certification. And I started in Atlanta, as I said. And so one of the things that really helped is I continued to substitute teach. And so um, I got a lot of experience from just being in the school and then um, pairing that with my courses. But then when I came here, I went to, I finished some courses at Trinity. And if the classes were small, we had lots of guest speakers who came in and shared their experiences. Um, uh, with us and so I felt like you know I've been in the schools like you know I'm, I'm ready I'm, and I was older so I um, I wasn't a, a, uh, an undergrad anymore so I was a lot more mature and a lot more focused um, on what it was I needed to do and what I wanted to do but the the training was was uh, being in the schools a lot was where I really really got uh, you know, hands-on experience um, that's much better than any textbook, because I hear student teachers say all the time, they didn't teach me this in school at all, you mm -hmm. know, when, they, when you have students before you, so that's right. pretty much it. So I rated the, my experience a seven up, seven, high seven. Mm. And the reason it wasn't an eight or didn't get to a 10 was that I don't know that my experiences in the classroom were early enough. 
We had lots of observation the last semester prior to going into student teaching, and we, we experienced quite a few innovative things for 27 years ago. Um, but had I had the experience that Carly did early in, my sophomore year, my junior year, I think I would have been more seasoned coming out. I had observation, but not in practice with mm. students. Mm. And so that, would, that would, would, would be what I see now happening in a lot of our, of our teacher prep programs. We have the teachers coming in, or the student teachers in the pre-service at a very early stage in their development of the process. And we're able to engage them in practice that we're that's meaningful to them. So when they leave, they have backwards design. They have the technology um, integration. They see those things that they can put into place right away, where in 27 years ago, that was still a theory. Mm -hmm. It wasn't in practice. Great. Thank you. So I'm going to shift my questions a little bit. That, that's very helpful in getting a better sense of who you guys are as practitioners. Um, to the roles you play. One of the reasons why we were excited about this conversation is because there is an explosion of teacher leadership opportunities happening in the field. Um, I say explosion relative to when I taught. Uh, I taught for years, but basically after 11, 12, 13 years of teaching, the only thing I could do if I wanted to take on leadership opportunities was become a principal, which I did. Um, but I was loving the classroom so much, if there were opportunities to stay within the classroom and lead, I may have done that. Um, each of you are in some shape, form, or fashion involved in other roles. What I'd love for you to do is talk a little bit about what those roles are. Tell us those roles and answer this question. Why do you do other things besides teach, like lead? What, what's, what's driving your interest there? Let's start in the middle. Let's start with uh, Adam. You ready? Yep. Awesome. All right. So tell us the roles. Remember to tell us the role and then why you do it. The roles and why. All right. So I am the department chair, which would be great if that just meant I got to go to meetings and then tell people what was going on. But because of a partnership between DCPS and TLI, that is a coaching role. So I get one extra release, one extra uh, period every other day that I go into different teachers' classrooms and I observe, and I track things, and I develop in, con in conversation with them individual goals, and uh, we work in six-week cycles. So I've worked with, I've got a department of nine people right now. I've worked with about four of them so far this year, and honestly, Wednesday, I'm gonna spend an hour in a teacher's classroom to collect data and develop whatever goal uh, she needs from there. So coaching, is a major part of my job right now, and time management is the major struggle of my job right now. Mm -hmm. But I do it because, for some reason, DCPS seems to think that I'm decent at education and that I should be influencing others, um, and I'm completely open to that. But I love my kids. I, I absolutely love teaching, and you said the only way you could do any leadership was to get out of the classroom when you were in there, and I, I could not do that right now. So I'm doing this because I love my kids, and I want to see them having a positive educational experience from ninth grade through 12th grade so that by the time they get to me, they can tell me what they learned and how much they enjoyed being in a social studies classroom. Um, side note, there's a lot of bad social studies instruction out there, mm. and it can be completely transformative if it's done in a way that is authentic to the student, to their interest, and that's, I'm doing this because I want them to have a good experience in my content area. Adam, just one quick follow-up. What does it take to be a good coach of other teachers from your perspective? And others who are maybe coaching can jump in on this one too. I'm learning that you have to bite your tongue. Just like with your students. I said earlier that my, my, my philosophy of education is transformed from a very like lecture to very much an inquiry model. I'm learning that a good coach is somebody who can let, who can guide the teacher to where they need to be versus tell them, all right, here's these three strategies, here's this engagement strategy, here's this complex text, here's a you know, common core writing task, and go. You have to lead them towards where they need to be so that the decision is theirs and so that they really take ownership of their own professional development. Mm -hmm. Great. Keisha, your extra duties, responsibilities. Um, well, um, I, and you can I, say something about the coaching thing, too, also. Um, 
when I heard Adam say he's not ready to, he loves his kids and he's not ready to leave them well, um, this is my third year that I've not had a class and I was kicking and screaming trying to at least have one class and my principal said no. So um, it wasn't possible with all of the other hats. So um, I understand about once you leave the classroom, uh, a lot of times you are given a lot of other responsibilities, um, which is why I have always wanted a job that was at least school-based and not in central office because it's always, oh, you'll get into the schools, we'll get you into the schools regularly, and it doesn't always happen. So I at least plant my feet in the schoolhouse so I can at least, if I'm not teaching a class, I can at least interact with the students and go in and out of classrooms as much as possible. Um, my role involves um, the AP coordinator, um, but I uh, do all of the professional development for the entire staff. We have about 150 teachers, and um, I, and mentoring them, I'm working with their content, um, the entire population from, you know, the PE department, you know, all the way to the science department. So I work with all of the teachers, but one of the things that I found is, that helps as a good coach is I listen. Mm -hmm. And um, I try to build relationships, because I knew when I, when I arrived at this school, they were looking at me like, really? Mm -hmm. What is she, how old is she? You know, what is she gonna, teach me or tell me or how she gonna help me. And so I build relationships, um, trusting relationships, because that's very important that they, that they trust you and that um, they see you as an expert. Even though I'm still their peer, it's non-evaluative. I, um, I tell them all the time, it's like the coach of the, the, the football team. Um, I'm here to help you. Um, and I ask a lot of questions, like Adam said, to guide them so that I'm never telling them or um, uh, making suggestions. But I want them to come to the realization on their own, their own that they need to make some changes or try some things, because change is hard for a lot of people. So um, that's just pretty much it. Great. Michelle? So th exactly what that's about. Um, a big part of my role um, in my school district is um, the professional learning. And so for the last several years, like Keisha, I've been out of the classroom and it's the empowerment of teachers, you know, and giving them that choice and voice about what's important for their students and really own, letting them own that and honoring their decisions that they make and the moves that they make in the classroom that are the best moves for the students. And it, giving them that empowerment, once they see someone believes in them, they work harder, they, they take ownership. And we talk a lot about, I wish the teachers would just buy in. Well, teachers buy in when we believe in them. And they work harder when someone says that what you're doing is good work. And so it's that connecting the dots. How do all these initiatives come into the one thing that's really important in that student achievement? And how do we help? We know the work is hard, we're not gonna say that it's not, but we're gonna help make those pieces come together so it's not 10 different plates. It might be one big plate, but we can hold it up together. Great. Carly? Um, so my primary role is teacher, um, but I've been really fortunate to have administrators who have given me opportunities to become a leader in my school um, and in the consortium that my school works with. Um, we work with about nine schools in DC and have a little bit of autonomy away from the district, primarily in our professional development opportunities. So I've had chances to lead professional development um, and also do some curriculum writing within our consortium, um, which has just really been great to see. You know, like I. 100% understand what's happening in my classroom with my kids, but to get some of that higher level um, experience too, where it's really seeing the impact that I'm not only having on my 24 kids, but the impact in my building across DC, and that's really exciting. Um, and you know, six years into the profession, I'm not ready to leave my classroom, um, but I really do feel fortunate that I am being pushed and challenged, and most of my leadership has been because of my own desire to learn and my own desire to become better at what I'm doing. You know, I meet with my coach every week, I meet with my principal, and because of that, they say, you know, like, 
you know more than you think you do. Can you do this? How about this? Um, so just really having that experience. And I love my kids and I love my classroom. And that really drives me to want to do more for my school and want to do more for the schools that we work with and for the district. Thank you very much. Um, so some of the words that you all mentioned, empowerment, trust, listen, guide, impact. Michelle talked about on student achievement. Um, so I don't want to be David, not David, um, we have a David, a Daniel Downer, um, but let me ask you a, a, a potentially difficult question. Um, well, first of all, let me start off by asking you, have you run into a teacher who you don't think really is interested in getting better? And if you have, what's your approach? What, 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 what should happen in that circumstance? Maybe you've never run into one. Um, maybe they don't exist. Um, but I'd love for you to talk a little bit about that, either one of you. And we don't have to go through anybody who's comfortable sharing. I think we've all run into teachers who are exhausted, who have tried multiple things and have not seen success. And so it may not be that they don't want to get better. They don't know what it is that looks like good instruction or doesn't, they're not seeing the, the results happen. So they're, they're stuck. And so it's easy when we're stuck and we're exhausted to get to that, that fixed mindset of the yes, but my kids won't do this, this, mm -hmm. this, and this. And to start to just kind of uncover that, to pull back the curtain and, and really find out what that root cause is and find out what it is that got them there in the first place. And sometimes that's not an easy road to find. And we're, you know, you, we're going to muddle together through that. But finding that small success with that teacher shifts things. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's, it's slowly and sometimes it's big leaps. Um, as an instructional coach, it's, it's like, you know, I always ask, well, I don't think this is going to work, but can we try it? Do you think we could try this together and just see? Is it looking at student work together to see what we can find that's positive in their essay to find out what it was that they did well before we look at all the misconceptions? Or is it team teaching a strategy? You know, just trying to find what's that one small piece, that one grain of sand that we could hang our hat on today and not look too far in the future. I don't think that anybody gets in the profession not wanting to be better. Mm. Um, but on the same time, like you're saying, there are teachers that are completely overworked and they've tried everything or they think they've tried everything. And that's actually been one of my bigger struggles as a, as a leader in the school is how to not only motivate, but also provide teachers with that, the assistance that they need. Um, a lot of it for me has been, how can I streamline my communication with them to make sure that they're not overwhelmed? Or sometimes it's actually running interference for them and telling you know, the, their supervisor, hey, you go through me, like we've got to, this person's getting overwhelmed, they need to be hearing one voice. Um, but all of that's kind of informal things. In terms of the actual coaching one-on-one -on -one with the teachers, I do try to keep the positive of celebrating the successes of the day, of the week, and talking about where you want to move the students towards. Um, for me, the biggest thing to avoid, though, is just that negative spiral, the downer idea of, well, I'm just going to talk about what our kids can't do and I'm always one about, well, they can't do it yet. And so just trying to keep it into that mindset of, it's not that it can't be done, it's that we've just gotta figure out a new approach. And honestly, too, being open and sharing my own struggles mm. within the classroom. Um, I don't have all the answers. Some of the teachers think that I do, and that is also overwhelming for, uh, for me. I think part of it too might just be a roadblock. Teaching is hard and whether it's the content that you're teaching or the strategies of how you're teaching it, um, I think there's just like a lot of like circulating questions and you know whether you've been in the profession forever, whether you're new, um, it's getting to like what's hard about it. Like is it unpacking the standard? Is it um, trying a new technology or a new strategy that you haven't used before? Um, because I don't, again, I don't think it's this like why can't can't get better, but more of like, 
I'm stuck and need whatever that next step is to get beyond that. Um, and I think that, you know, being educators, being teachers, really being passionate about our kids growing, it's that working together and really finding out what can we do? Is it more strategy PD? Is it, you know, looking at the standards deeply, you know, the rigors of Common Core? I think a lot of people are like, uh, what, like, what does this look like? What does it have to look like? How do I need to change um, the way I'm teaching? And so really getting to that roadblock and then getting past it. Uh, the three of them have said quite a bit that um, I agree with, but I, I don't know that I've run across teachers who weren't interested in getting better. They were just, um, they just didn't know what they needed to do. And I, and I try to get them to understand because usually they'll say they'll know their content, you know, it, the, like the back of their hand and they'll tell me how many degrees they have in this content, but they're not delivering it to the students. And so I said, well, I need, let's work on Let's just pick one thing, and, and I don't need you to do it for me, I don't need you to do it for the principal, I need you to do it for the students. Because a lot of times the students would even say, he's really smart, but he's not a good teacher. He just, you know, they know that, the, that, that this, I'm thinking of a man in particular, he, he knows all this information and it's here, but getting it to the students is really a challenge. And so I said, let's just pick one strategy and work on that, and let's talk about why, what's working and what's not working. And, but, um, so it's just a matter of identifying something small and starting small and, and working on that. And, it's, and you'll see the results and the students will see the results as well. Um, so it's not going to be perfect, but it's going to, we're going to see some, some changes. Because change is really hard for um, most teachers who need some support. That's part of the battle is they've been doing it the same way for a long time and so getting them to change is is really a challenge for themselves and and everyone else great so we've got about 10 minutes left in this panel and i want to make sure audience if you have questions be thinking about those questions now but i'm going to tee up a couple of questions for our panelists that i think are critical as it relates to um, some things that several of you have alluded to, particularly college ready, college and career ready standards, common core, depending upon wherever you are, you may call them something different, but higher standards for kids, and teacher evaluation and feedback systems. Two huge uh, bodies of work that are impacting a significant number of teachers all across the country. What I'd love for you to do, each of you, is talk, and we can take college and career standards first. Give me a plus and a delta about how that work is happening from your perspective. Plus meaning, I love this about it. Delta, boy, we've got to figure out how to do this better. Let's start with higher standards for kids, and anyone can start. So I love the direction that social studies is going. Um, with the NCSS and the C3 framework, the college career and civic life framework, it, it forces students to do something with their content knowledge. Um, taking informed action is the, is the buzzword there. But in terms of the actual classroom practice, uh, what I'm seeing is some teachers want to skip the parts about how students need to be actually developing questions and mm. actually developing inquiries and evaluating resources. They just want to skip right to the end where you get to go make a speech or something. Mm. Um, and so I think that the end goal is, is something that is definitely needed, but I think that the implementation is on the very like basic classroom level is where a lot of times the, uh, there's areas for growth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, earlier you alluded that I'm an IB coordinator, and so when the higher... Um, for the IB world, the approaches to learning are the critical thinking skills. It's the communication skills. It's the being able to transfer to new and novel. The same thing for the new standards. And so sitting with principals in our district that have been part of the IB program and having that be a school in a school, we talked about how common core standards are allowing all students to be critical thinkers all students to communicate at a high level, 
all students to construct meaning and be those problem solvers. It's not that you have to be in a special program. It's not a STEM program. It's not, you know, IB. It's not the classical. It's all students having these abilities now to be college, career, and community ready. And it's a, it's a gift that we have. The delta is it's hard work, right? And it's, it's that every day asking our students to take ownership, every day asking ourselves, how will we help students to transfer this, to apply this? It's not knowing for knowing's sake. We don't have that ability anymore. We need to learn these concepts and put them into practice and get to the so what every day. Okay, so the plus would be that um, the students are gonna struggle. And I um, tell the students all the time, my teachers, sometimes the beauty is in the struggle. I've seen some AP students struggle and they were so happy that they got that C, that they were like, this is the best struggle I've ever had. And there was a lot of joy in not giving up. And so the standards force that um, as well, but the, the delta would be the professional learning um, around in implementing it um, because uh, there's a gap or lots of gaps in um, the professional learning as far as the teachers and the expectations. Um, so that's where the delta is. Mm -hmm. So it's really interesting. You said the plus was a struggle. I think it's, that's a beautiful idea. Um, the kids will actually have to grapple more. Um, Thank you. Carly? Um, I agree. I think the standards um, create opportunities for students to be thinking critically and um, pushes their own understanding beyond just like, what is it? But why is it? What is the purpose? What's important? And it also um, encourages teachers to go deeper with our own content knowledge also. We're unpacking the standards together. Um, and so it requires us to be more critical thinkers too, whether we're teaching second grade or high school. Um, I think one of the things that um, we've struggled with though is that there's just a lot of standards. And, um, and so there are, you know, whether it's holes from one grade to the next or like, you know, in second grade, we always talk about like, why is money only in second grade um, it just you know like where's the foundational skill for that um, and then where are they using it in the future and so because there's so much so many it's almost like this marathon every year of like we know there's so much and we really want to go deeply because we know that that's what the standards are trying to get at and trying to do but there's just so many great so let's do that same question with um teacher evaluation and feedback systems, which during my keynote I said we oftentimes see them as two different things, and I'm presenting the question as they're two different things, which I find a way to blend them. But um, the plus and the delta from your perspective. Michelle, you mind starting now? So p part of our work um, when standards came and our um, educator effectiveness tool came out at the same time was to bring those two together, to marry them. And to be accomplished on the teacher evaluation system is for student ownership, for students to be able to advocate for what they know, where their gaps are, and to be able to articulate what that looks like, for students to feel safe in the classroom and feel that, what they, that they have a voice. And so everything on the far right is about the student and what they can do. And so for me as a teacher, I'm thinking about my intentionality in my classroom, that instructional ladder that if I assume students can, I'm probably creating that potential for a gap. The first time I make an assumption that they can already do it and I haven't intentionally taught that, that's that possibility for a gap to widen. So I have to stop and do that backwards design. And so as I look at the educator effectiveness, that's that part every day that I'm planning with intention that I'm looking at instruction, that I'm allowing students to be the owners of their learning and to guide me where I'm going to teach. Many times in the past, we taught topics, we taught specific novels, we taught whatever it was, but we didn't look at the skills that students needed to develop that next piece. And so now with the standards coming in and saying, this is the grade level expectation of your students, where are they in their learning progression and how do I plan and collaborate with my peers so that we do reach that grade level expectation and push them to that next level? Plus Delta, teacher evaluation and feedback system. Maybe there are no deltas. The just delta, all 
is the, uh, with the consistency with the evaluation uh, and the feedback. I think um, a lot of times uh, teachers will have three evaluators and they all say three different things and they're, they're a little concerned about, um, I guess the, how can I say this without, they're concerned that um, the, the evaluators did not, it wasn't fair, and they, um, there didn't seem to be consistency in, in what they said, and so we're wondering if they're all familiar with the same, I guess, um, evaluation tool. Um, that's a delta that I hear a lot, um, and that the feedback sometimes is, it doesn't give them enough to make the changes. It's, it's bland or generic. Um, and I, I've seen some of the feedback uh, when teachers share it with me, and I, and, I, and, I, and I understand that. So that would be a delta. Um, the, the plus is that if you don't, if you teach like that every day and not just when you're having an evaluation, then that's, to me, that's, that's what I encourage the, the new teachers and the current teachers to, to uh, do, because I planned all the time up, you know, and I plan now, and I just don't understand people who don't see that as being um, valuable, and not to just to have this dog and pony or planning, big planning going on when they know they're going to have an evaluation, but plan like that on a regular basis. Thank you. I want to jump in at the very end of that because I actually had my uh, evaluator pop in today. In DCPS, uh, you get two evaluations from a central office person twice a year and uh, they can show in unannounced at any time. And so I'm sitting here thinking through this, all right, so my kids were copying down the agenda from the board like they're supposed to do, and they were also talking about a Christmas movie. So does that mean that I am a three or a four on you know, bell-to-bell -bell instruction? Mm. So I absolutely think that teacher evaluation systems, the way that they are, they, it's, it's holding teachers accountable for research-based best practices. There's nothing in the standards that I am evaluated on that I disagree with. Um, but I think that oftentimes what happens is there's ones that being a culture of compliance rather than teacher mm -hmm. development with it. And that's why I'm happy to be that coach for my, uh, for my department, because I can say, well, when you're evaluated, they're gonna look at this, and maybe you could try it this way. Um, but at the same time, I was completely on edge, because I knew that this evaluation had to get done by next Thursday and they could have started it in September. Mm -hmm. So I've had to essentially bring my A game every single day, and some days you just, you need a break. So I'm gonna relax tomorrow. <laughs> Still gonna have some great lessons because I planned them already. Thanks, Anne. Um, I'll go right off of that. We have the same evaluation system. Um, and so I do think that like the rubric that we're being evaluated with, you know, in thinking about the Common Core standards, it is a rigorous rubric. It, in, it requires teachers to get at the higher level thinking and to make sure that all students are challenged wherever um, level they are, there's differentiation. And so there is that like push. And since we do have two surprise evaluations, it does you know, make teachers do that a lot, but good teachers do that anyway. And so I think that like the, um, the downfall of that for me is that it's very number based. And so where like, even if your evaluator gives you like the best feedback in the world, if the number isn't where you want it to be, it's really discouraging. And the number is attached to highly effective and effective and minimally effective and not effective. And so like, you know, whether it was an off day for you, an off day for your kids, nobody wants to feel like a minimally effective teacher. And I think that a lot of the good feedback um, isn't always translated because there's that number attached. Mm -hmm. I know I feel best evaluated when it's like by my instructional coach and it, there is no number or like, you know, when my principal just walks through and sees what's happening and gives me really great feedback, but I'm not stressing about whether I'm an effective teacher or not. Great, so we've come to the end of our time and unfortunately we, we had to start a little late because the previous session went a little longer. Um, but I want to make sure if there is any if there are any pressing pressing questions that you'd like to, the whole audience to hear, I'd like to make sure we give you an opportunity to do that. Anyone in the audience, of course, you could always follow up with uh, our individual presenters. 
uh, afterwards. Um, but what I'd love to do from them is just end with, if you don't mind, a positive student story. So a positive student story, a student that's on your mind or impact that you had or something you had related to a student that we want to end with. Who wants to start? And they, and they told me not to give them the questions ahead of time. <laughs> they were like, let's be spontaneous. Carly. Um, so this is definitely on my mind. I got thrown up on this morning. Um, one of my, thrown yes, up? thrown up on. Um, one of my students I said came positive in. Positive students. It is. Really it's okay. really positive. Um, and so it, and it was just like a little on my pants. It's like okay. Um, but but um, what I really loved was like the kids who sat around her just like took really good care of her. One was like I can walk you to the nurse. One was like. Miss Fox, I don't think you realized, but like she threw up. And so like they were just really caring. And I think we get so caught up in the academics and like what are you doing in math and what are you doing in reading? But like really taking the time to like mold these kids as like the future of our country and just like recognizing that and just like the small moments that like make you laugh and make you smile and love the kids that we work with every day. Great. Thank you. My school has been through a lot of turnover over the past I've only been there for five years, and it's just, we were reconstituted, we've had, uh, yeah, it's just been rough. And I've been cursed out just every day for the past five years, literally. But when students are starting to come to class and actually take ownership of their work and hold each other accountable, and when I, today, I was able to actually say for the first time in a while, when a kid asked a question, I was able to say, so and so, you can actually help them with that while I go over here. and. Just that we're building a culture of student accountability that is almost being built from scratch and it's a long process, but the kids are buying into it. So just my positive thing is today, having a student explain uh, DC home rule in 1874 to another student was amazing. That's great, thank you. Um, I think that um, it's just important to build relationships with students. Um, I've taught some students um, who were very distrusting. Um, they didn't trust me or anyone else um, at first. And then once you let them know that you're just, you know, you go to the grocery store like everyone else, you, and um, they start to um, trust you and they believe in themselves. And I have always been very big on not just teaching the content, but life skills as well. So I wanted my young ladies to act like young ladies. I wanted my young men to act like gentlemen. And so I'm proud to say that I keep in contact with quite a few who are in college now, and they like to text me and tell me how they made good choices. You would be so proud of me in the restaurant. <laughs> I put my napkin in my lap, or whatever they did. I mean, these, I mean, these are things that I'm like, you remember that? But I mean, those are the stories that you like to hear and get emails about. Um, you know, I got a picture from a student who was somewhere with Earl Graves. I'm like, oh, how do you know this? You know, so things like that just make you feel warm inside that they didn't appear to be listening and getting it at the time, but it all comes full circle um, at some point. Great, thank you. Okay, so we've got kids that are throwing up and they're <laughs> the safe and feel belonging. Um, one of the like big moments that have happened just in the last couple of weeks. I've gotten the opportunity to work with some fourth graders for, for an extended period of time and we were in the hall one day and we we're looking at all of the essays they had up on the wall and this is in the middle of November and they've written four extended essays. And this is fourth grade and I'm saying, like, what are you doing? Why are you writing so much in your classes? And of course they looked at me like, duh, Mrs. Logan, that's what we do every day. Mm. And I said, well, what, what about this writing is going to help you next year or the following year? And I mean, it was just like that. I'm going to be taking notes. I know how to argue. And, and it was just all of those skills that we are intentional about teaching. We're just not sure if it's transferring yet. And these kiddos were just, they couldn't wait to tell me about what they were doing and why they were doing it, and how one little boy said, well, it's going to help me in my AP class. Now, I know his brother or sister must be in an AP class, but it transferred for that moment when he was having the conversation with me. Awesome. Would you please help me? Well, thank you, our panelists. <laughs> Took time out of their busy schedule. Um, we applaud them for the work that they do on an ongoing basis. Thank you very much. <laughs>